the, the scientific rediscovery of God, I think, can open up the possibility of finding ultimate personal meaning for each of us as we seek to know that, our creator, the person who made us and all things. But it also, I think, can inspire us to do better science. It's a both and, not an either or. Good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we, we don't have a ton of time left. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you can sum these up, but uh, the philosopher and humanist James Croft uh, offered what you describe as an aggressive critique of your book on philosophical grounds. I'm just curious, what was that? Oh, it was an interesting debate because uh, I was actually on uh, a vacation at, at a little cabin and people in Britain that I knew told me they'd set up an interesting conversation about my book with, with the philosopher who was interested. And I said, in oh. person? And I, well, by Zoom. Everything oh, by was Zoom, Zoom in the, you know, the COVID days. So I got on, and I was in a, uh, a rustic old sweatshirt and jacket and thought it was just an informal... Cr- well, this philosopher had come loaded for bear with uh, <laughs> PowerPoints. Who are these friends that s- set this up Yeah, for right, you? right. <laughs> and uh, it was a let's you and him fight conversation. So... Anyway, he had a a number of technical objections. The main one was the idea that you couldn't really infer the activity of a designing intelligence in the past unless you had knowledge that there was such a being. You already had knowledge that there was such a being there, okay? And there is a sensible, there's something sensible behind that objection because when we infer or when we uh, retrodict a the action of a cause in the past, it's helpful if we know both that the cause in question has the power to, to, to produce the effect we're trying to explain, but that we have independent knowledge that, the, co- that the, 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 cause, the causal agent or entity was actually present. We have both those things that we can feel very solid. Well, make, that would be nice, be but nice, if you don't, but, you're but you still can't always stuck do with that. trying to figure it out. But there's also a way to circumvent this, and this happened to be what, one of the key elements of my, my PhD, is that In the case that you know that there's only one known cause of a given effect, if it's true that when there's smoke, there's always fire, you can infer fire definitively even if you don't have independent knowledge of the fire if you just see the smoke wafting up over the hillside. Okay, so when the the, the cause that you're trying to infer is a necessary cause, it's the only known cause of the effect, you can make very definitive retrodictive inferences from effect back to cause. And so he posed this as an objection to the argument from information in DNA and said, well, you don't have independent knowledge of a designer. And I said, we don't need to, because in this case, there's only one known cause of the production of large amounts of digital information, and that is an intelligent mind. And then I used a little illustration to get the point across. I said, imagine you went to Antarctica, and you were assuming, like all other archaeologists, that there'd never been, life, uh, there'd never been any life on the planet or on that continent, but then, you know, you, you got deep into an ice cave and got, got deeper in, and there was, you know, there, you got all the way to the rock, and lo and behold, there were inscriptions on, on there dating from, you know, uh, two million years ago. What would you now infer? Well, you didn't have any independent knowledge that there were, that Antarctica had ever been inhabited, but if you have in, informational inscriptions in, uh, carved into the rock, you're going to have to change your opinion. So, why? Because information is a distinctive diagnostic of intelligent activity. There's only one known cause of the production of information. So that's what our little argument was about. And I had to sort of suddenly it's just fun- it's recall funny all this on vacation. What everybody sort of... <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think we all know what you just said intuitively, even if we've never heard the term retrodictive before. Um, <laughs> but when you're talking... To a philosopher like that, you, you know, get you, words you, like this. You have yeah, to, you, yeah. you have to resort to those words to explain what most people know. Well, James, um, James was an interesting guy. He was a secular humanist clergyman at a congregation in, I think, St. Louis. He'd done a Harvard PhD in philosophy, British-born. So we had a lot in common, except that we were on opposite sides of the issue. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm Uh, not a secular humanist clergyman, but he was, you know, interested enough in religion to be a clergyman, although a different kind of religion, yeah. You you also mentioned um, Roger Roger Penrose's new cosmological model, uh, and some people have been posing it as a challenge to the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Can you explain what I just said? (laughs) 
It's, it's been one, uh, it's, uh, one of the things that was raised in opposition to the argument of the book is that there are some newer cosmological models than the ones that I addressed in the book. I addressed the Big Bang, the steady state, the oscillating model, and the, the, probably the hottest topic in theoretical physics and cosmology is this idea of quantum cosmology, and I had three chapters on that at the end. It's the Krauss universe came from nothing idea, and um, let's not get into it, it's heavy. But the, the newer thing that came up was um, something from Sir Roger Penrose it's called the cyclical conformal cosmology, big, big words. Um, but it's, it's a variant off of the earlier oscillating universe idea. The oscillating universe had the universe expanding in the present time, in the forward direction of time, but eventually recollapsing, right. and then bouncing and recollapsing and bouncing an infinite number of times. So it was a way of explaining the observation that the universe is currently expanding, without, but still holding on to an infinite universe. Okay. And the problem with that idea was exposed, a number of problems. One is there's not enough matter to cause a recollapse. But number two, even if there were bound, subsequent bounces, with each, ex each time the universe expands, the energy of expansion is sort of creating greater entropy or disorder in the universe. And so with each cycle, there's less energy available to do work. And so it'd be like a bouncing ball. Eventually, even if you had an, an, uh, a cycle of expansions and contractions, the ball would eventually damp out and, and you'd run out of steam. And since we don't live in a universe like that, you can infer that the universe hasn't been around an infinitely long time. Um, Penrose has offered a modification of that idea. Instead of having an infinite number of uh, expansions and contractions, he envisions the universe expanding outward, and then through an unknown force he calls the uh, or a, a unknown field called a phantom field, he imagines that a new universe would bust out of a little patch of that universe, and would and at that point this phantom field would spontaneously. Um, uh, decrease entropy, so there'd be more order and more energy available to, to do work, but only at the place where the, uni uh, where the universe was, was, new universe was sprouting from. Now, some, one of his colleagues at Oxford has actually critiqued this idea because he said there's no physical field that has the attributes of a Penrose phantom field, uh, because what the phantom field does is it spontaneously creates order out of disorder in just the right place at just the right time and causes an abrupt change of state, literally a creation event of a new universe. So you can get around the God hypothesis, but only by positing a physical field that has the powers of agency, that has God-like powers. So this that's is, the trick. That's yeah. <laughs> that, this is what I, I... I mean, ultimately, uh, this is fun, uh, at least for me, because I, I you see... Um, in a way, you see these patterns, right? You, you, you see people desperately looking for ways around what you can't get around. And they are very uh, intelligent and creative. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got this problem called reality created by, you know, the Lord of Hosts. And you just keep bumping up against it. So it's sort of funny to see where, where we are now and... and who is willing to kind of face it and, and, and who isn't. But I, I'm not as literary as you are, Eric, but I did have one line in my book that, that I thought, well, that's pretty literary, uh, where I was telling the story about Einstein and um, his fiddling with the cosmological constant to portray the universe as static. And then I said, but the heavens talked back. And the evidence became what determined the outcome of the, of the theorizing. And I think, in a sense, the, the heavens, the digital code, the fine-tuning of the universe, the planetary fine-tuning, the, all the anthropic biological parameters that our, our colleague Michael Denton is writing about, I mean, there's so much evidence that's pointing towards a purposive uh, universe that was designed and created by a purpose of intelligence. It does get hard to, to, to ignore it.